Um, so, hey everyone, thanks for coming to my talk. Um, today we're basically going to take a look at uh, some of the trends in exploitation and some of the mitigations and security enhancements uh, that have been made to modern operating systems, um, which have resulted in exploitation becoming uh, less adopted, actually, than it's ever historically been in the red team sphere. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and get into it. Uh, so as I mentioned, my name is Connor. Um, I'm a sensor engineer at CrowdStrike. And I'm primarily just interested in anything low-level operating systems, internals, uh, C assembly, et cetera. So quick high-level agenda for today. Uh, first, we'll talk about uh, what exploitation looks li looked like at its peak. Um, then we'll take a look at some of the first exploit mitigations like DEP and ASLR, uh, which you may be familiar with. And then lastly, we'll take a look at how some of the changes to security from an exploitation perspective have really uh, changed the overall approach we take to exploitation. So exploitation in the golden years. Um, so memory corruption vulnerabilities are, um, they've been prominent for a really long time. Uh, this FRAC article is actually older than me, uh, and that's not even the first mention of uh, memory corruption vulnerabilities. Um, so on FRAC, uh, smashing the stack for fun and profit was one of the first mainstreamed um, documentations of stack overflows. So exploits at this time, they're not really as documented or accessible as they are today with the amount of research published. Uh, but to the contrary, they're very trivial to exploit by today's standards. So for instance, memory, all of it is readable, writable, executable, and static. Um, so if you've ever done like a basic buffer overflow, if you've ever done like the OSCP exam or anything of that nature, um, it's pretty simple. Like you find like a stir copy, which is very prominent back in the 90s. Um, that will write data to the stack. You smash the stack. Um, and on the stack are return addresses, right? Those return addresses are used to jump somewhere in memory. So you overwrite the return address because it's on the stack where you can control, and then you like hard code the memory address of your shell code, and execution just takes you to your shell code by default. Um, and nothing really stops this at this point. So this kind of widespread exploitation led to the implementation of a mitigation most of us are probably familiar with, with DEP, Data Execution Prevention, that's been around since 2005 in Windows. Um, so basically what that says is we separate boundaries between data and code. Um, so something like the stack, that's meant for holding data. It's not really meant for holding code. So why does that need to be executable? So basically we can just mark that as non-executable. Uh, so in this example, um, we have a jump RSP, which is a fake return address we've used to override a return address on the stack. And that's going to redirect execution onto the stack where we see we have a bunch of no-op operations. Um, and when we try to execute one of those, we get an access violation because, again, DEP says this is non-executable. So since the stack is non-executable, DEP led to a few changes um, in exploitation. Uh, the most notable one are code reuse attacks. So if you've ever at least heard of the term return-oriented programming or ROP, um, this is where this comes from. Um, so what happens is we basically reuse existing code that's already executable in an application. Um, so we have something called a ROP gadget, uh, which are all of these uh, items uh, highlighted in red. And what a ROP gadget is, it's an interesting series of assembly instructions that end in a return. Well, if we're dealing with a stack overflow, what do we control? The stack. And what does the return do? It takes whatever's located at the stack and queues it up for execution. So each time we execute a ROP gadget, it ends in a return, and what does it do? It goes to the stack, picks up what's ever there, and executes it. Well, what's on the stack next? The next ROP gadget. So by nature, each ROP gadget uh, returns execution into the previous one. And what that allows us to do basically is call Windows API functions, uh, which are exported uh, suite of functions on Windows that allow you to uh, manipulate memory, open network connections, et cetera, to do something like call virtual protect. And what virtual protect can do is change the permissions of memory. So basically, we can use a first stage payload to um, mark the stack as executable because it's non-executable, and then just go about exploitation the old way. So that solves the debt problem, right? But there is an issue, and that's because if you look at these memory addresses, they're hard-coded from app.dll, and we're relying on static memory in the application to bypass step. Well, static ROP gadgets like this led to the implementation of another mitigation called address space layout randomization, or ASLR. So memory is now randomized on a per-boot basis. So we saw all those ROP gadgets earlier, which we basically parsed an executable for already existing code because we can't bring any new executable code. So we looked at existing executable code, right? 
that code is located somewhere in memory. Uh, in this example, it was like 7FF1234, just as an example. Well, ASLR means that memory is going to be randomized on the next reboot. So that ROP gadget is not going to be located there anymore, correct? Um, so ASLR basically means we can't use hard-coded pointers from an application to bypass DEP. So what that means is with ASLR and DEP enabled, you first have to bypass ASLR in order to bypass DEP. Um, there is some caveats with this, though, and that's that DLLs need to compile with ASLR. Uh, so for a long time, when this first came out, attackers could just abuse DLLs that weren't compiled with ASLR because the, the memory uh, there was still static. And there is a well-known um, case of this. Um, Internet Explorer 8 used an old version of the uh, Microsoft C runtime library when Java was enabled. Um, so obviously no one in the early 2000s used Internet Explorer 8 with Java in their browser. Um, so this never happened, obviously I'm being sarcastic. Um, but just by nature, that loaded a DLL into the process without ASLR. So if you're exploiting Internet Explorer 8 back in the day when that's at its peak, um, ASLR is a non-issue. But for modern exploits, uh, we need to rely on information disclosure vulnerabilities. So we need to somehow map or leak the layout of memory um, in order to bypass ASLR with a separate vulnerability. So these are great, but what's the issue? Um, this is a screenshot taken from a talk that Matt Miller and Dave Weston from Microsoft did at Black Hat USA 2016. And what this chart actually shows is that exploitation over the, or excuse me, vulnerabilities are always going up. So I think this starts in like um, the early 2000s and goes through 2016. So the vulnerabilities are going up, but as time goes on, the actual in the wild exploits are going down. Um, but we can see that in 2010, that's the height of exploitation. Well, when was DEP and ASLR placed into the OS? Several years before this, right? So exploitation was still rampant with DEP and ASLR enabled at its peak. So basically what this talk is going to look at are what's caused this drop off in exploitation uh, in just the last few years in terms of the public sphere, if not for DEP and ASLR. So we'll kind of take a look at what a post DEP and ASLR world looks like. So DEP and ASLR, they, they do a lot, but they don't solve all of our problems. Um, and that's because exploitation, it's, it's trivial, um, but it's not as trivial um, because there's two distinct characteristics that allow exploits to work. The first is hijacking control flow, right? What did our stack overflow rely on? We corrupted a return address, which returned execution somewhere else into memory. So we hijacked execution. That's the first thing. And then additionally, our exploit executes some kind of shell code. So these are the two things that actually allow exploits to work. And DEP and ASLR, they make it more difficult, but they don't really address these issues, right? If we can uh, uh, de-randomize memory, well, we can just use like a ROP chain to mark the stack as executable and just do exploitation the old way, right? We're still violating this tenet of execution of unsigned shellcode. Um, so that's what we're going to be taking a look at is addressing these two main things that uh, exploits do. So the first is hijacking control flow. And this is done in one of two ways primarily, but this is not a comprehensive list. Um, the first is overriding a function pointer, which we'll talk about in a second. And then obviously overriding return address, which we've already spoken about. So what is a function pointer? A function pointer is also known as an indirect call. So this is a call into a non-absolute memory address, essentially. And what that means is that that's either a call through a register or a call through a pointer. <clears throat> well, what's the issue with this? How do we know what's in RAX, for instance, when the call happens? Is that legitimate memory in RAX, a CP register, or is it benign? We don't know that. Additionally, this call through a pointer. What's on the other side of that pointer? There's no way for us to know this, right? The OS will just go, hey, I know I need to execute this function pointer. Let me go ahead and do it. So if we're an attacker and we can override a function pointer similarly to overriding a return address, well, what's the program going to do? It's going to execute that function pointer and call into it. Well, we've hijacked it, so it's going to call into our attacker-controlled memory. So an example of this, um, browsers, they're very popular exploit targets. And they also happen to be written in C++. Well, C++ uses a lot of virtual functions. And virtual function tables inherently store an array of function pointers. So what we can do is we can locate a function pointer that it can be invoked by an accessible method in JavaScript, which we'll see an example in the next slide. We then can overwrite that function pointer. And then in JavaScript, when we call through that method, 
when it gets looked up on the OS backend, it's going to look for that entry in the virtual function table. Well, since we've controlled it, it's going to call into our attacker controlled memory. So um, here's an example of this. So Chakra Core, that's Microsoft's um, open source implementation of their Chakra JavaScript engine. Uh, that's what Edge used pre-Chromium. And here we have a virtual function table for a data view. A data view is a type of object in JavaScript, right? So we see there's a bunch of function pointers here that are referenced by this virtual function table. And the one highlighted here is set item. So if you've ever written JavaScript before, or C Sharp or anything like that, where you can do dot and then invoke some method, um, you can do that in JavaScript for a data view object. You can call dot set some sort of data. And that on the back end, we'll call this set item function. Well, what happens when we overwrite that with 41, 41, 41, 41, for instance? In JavaScript, when we call dot set item, what's going to be called now? 41, 41, 41, 41. So therefore, we control execution by overriding a function pointer into our controlled memory. Well, how do we stop something like this? Well, the answer is something called control flow integrity. And what CFI is, it's a way to ensure that the control flow of an application isn't tampered with. Um, and Windows supports both forwards edge, which is checking calls and jumps like we showed in the last example, and also backwards edge, which are returns, which we'll take a look at here shortly as well. So forwards, forwards edge inspection. As I mentioned, this is inspecting calls and jumps. Microsoft's implementation of this is known as Control Flow Guard, or CFG. Uh, this was shipped as an optional update back in Windows 8.1. And we can now inspect call into register or call through a function pointer. Um, CFG is supported in both user mode and kernel mode. And the way CFG works is at compile time in an application, a bitmap is created. And that bitmap has a dictionary, essentially, of all of the known functions used in valid control flow transfers. So for instance, all of those virtual functions we saw earlier, if they're called, they'll be stored in that bitmap because we know eventually they'll be called into. And what happens is every time a call through a pointer happens, we now, instead of just directly calling the function, we check it. And we look in the bitmap and we say, hey, the function we're about to call, do we know about this somewhere in this bitmap, which is the source of truth? Well, if we know um, that this function exists and it's a legitimate call target, well, we can call into it. However, this can also detect now if we've overwritten a function pointer with something like 4141, 4141, 41, or other attacker controlled memory. And the way this works is instead of doing a call through a register, all of those are replaced now with a call through this guard dispatch I call F pointer function. So now, as I mentioned with CFG, when we call into 41, 41, 41, 41, uh, we can validate if this is a valid call target. And this is kind of what this looks like. So when execution reaches this um, loader dispatch user call target function, the address of the bitmap, which contains all of that information about all the valid functions we know about, is loaded into the R11 register, and RAX contains the address to be checked. Now look what happens in the screenshot here now. When we reach the dispatch function, we get an access violation, and that's because RAX contains an address which is not a valid call target. So control flow guard basically mitigates function pointer overwrites. But there's a caveat to that. That's not entirely true, and that's for compatibility reasons. So consider we have application.exe that we've written, right? When we compile it, when that bitmap is created with all of the known valid uh, call targets, um, that's all we know about in our current application, right? Well, if you've ever developed in Windows, you may know that you call into Windows APIs a lot, which are exported by like kernel 32, NTDLL, et cetera. Well, if you call something like virtual alloc from application.exe, where is that function located at? In kernel base.dll, right? So technically, application.exe's view of you calling into a function exported by another DLL, that's not a valid call target because it's located somewhere else. We don't know about it. So because of this, CFG by default um, allows all of the exported functions to be used as valid call targets. So what that means is we can't overwrite a function pointer with something like a heap address or shell code, but we can still overwrite function pointers with virtual protect, which we saw earlier. We can still override it with virtual alloc. We still have to control the arguments, but we can still do that, right? And not only that, CFG doesn't check to ensure that the function you're calling is the function it's intended to be. What does it check? If the function exists in the bitmap. So we can also call other valid call targets in the bitmap, right? So Microsoft Edge, uh, let's say it has function one. 
You can overwrite that with function two because they're both used in valid control flow transfers and they're located in the bitmap. So the issue with this is we really want CFG to uh, mitigate function pointer overwrites by only allowing the developer intended function to be called, right? So how do we improve on this? Because CFG essentially for all intents and purposes has a fail open. Well, that's where extended flow guard comes in. Microsoft loves their guards. Um, so extended flow guard is basically what CFG should have always been. So what we do now is XFG, it works by hashing the prototype of a function. So functions, right? When you set it up, it has, they have a number of parameters, right? They ha each of those parameters has types. It returns a value maybe, right? That's known as the prototype. Um, and that should be unique to each function, right? Um, a function, um, should be unique based on its prototype. Um, so what we do is that's the most unique information we can attribute to a function. So we take that information and we hash it. And that hash is placed eight bytes above every valid call target. So now instead of looking through the bitmap first, what we do is we use that hash in a comparison. So the new dispatch function just replaces um, I call with XF, or excuse me, CFG with XFG, or actually just adds XFG in, excuse me. And that hash is placed into R10. And since each function has a unique hash now, instead of depending on the bitmap, we now can basically um, use the hash as the comparison, right? So if function prototype has, you know, two parameters, both are of type ints, but another function, which is a valid call target, for instance, which could be used in a CFG bypass, has no parameters. Well, we can't use, we can't overwrite a function pointer using that because we expect the function that's intended essentially. So with XFG, we've narrowed down the number of functions that can actually be used in a function pointer overwrite to theoretically only the developer intended function. But also there's an issue with this and that's because XFG is currently instrumented but it's not enforced. So in the current implementation, uh, if an XFG check looks at those hashes and says, hey, we have a mismatch here, function pointer override occurred. For compatibility right now, it just defaults back to CFG. So what that means is extended flow guard is just a trampoline or a jump into control flow guard. So basically we, all, we only have to worry about control flow guard right now, um, but that's subject to change. Um, this is a newer mitigation that's mainly available in Windows Insider Preview, and it's not fully enforced yet, but that's to be determined in the future. So we've talked about function pointer overwrites, um, but what about returns, right? In our example earlier, in the beginning of the talk, we had uh, a stack overflow where we overwrote a return address on the stack, right? What do we do about those? Well, a well-known limitation of the aforementioned uh, mitigations we talked about are return control flow transfers. So this is Microsoft's um, mitigation bug bounty site when control flow guard used to be a part of it. It's not a part of the bug bounty anymore. I wonder why. Um, and so um, one of the out of scope um, things with the CFG um, mitigation bug bounty was hijacking control flow via return address corruption. Because this is a known limitation of control flow guard. We don't care about return addresses. We only look at calls and jumps. Well, how does a return address make it onto the stack? Well, when a call happens, the underlying microcode on the CPU pushes a return address onto the stack. Why is that? Well, when we call a function, we're calling some kind of callee, which is a function we want to execute. That function is probably going to return a value. And when it performs the return, how does it know where to return execution to? Well, it looks on the stack for the return address to say, hey, whoever called me, tell me where I need to go back after execution. So what if we could leak the stack? And what if we could corrupt the return address before the return address has executed, right? Well, when that return address is executed, it'll call into our attacker controlled memory. Um, this is an example of this from a type confusion vulnerability in Microsoft Edge um, that I worked on a while ago. Um, so what happens here? The stack, which is located at the bottom of the screen, uh, and it has 41s outlined in red, that's what's located on the stack pointer. And a return instruction is happening, and we're trying to return into 41, 41, 41. We see there's an access violation, but not because of CFG. If we actually look at the function, it's a function from chocker.dll, which again, it's that Microsoft JavaScript engine. So there's no checking going on here. We're crashing because 41s aren't a valid memory address. But this is a proof of concept to say, hey, we can control the instruction pointer with 41s or whatever memory we want because return addresses, they aren't checked. So as I mentioned, we can still control execution through return address overrides. 
And due to this, Microsoft actually tried to implement a software mitigation um, to protect these return addresses called Return Flow Guard, very creative name. Um, and Return Flow Guard was actually deprecated, um, so you can't find it anymore because uh, their red team at Microsoft found an inherent design flaw where an attacker could always leak um, the protected return addresses, essentially, so they deprecated it. Um, and because of that, it, uh, Windows now relies on a hardware mitigation instead um, called Intel Control Flow Enforcement Technology, or CET, to protect those return addresses on the stack. So what is CET? It's Hardware Assisted Control Flow Integrity. So CET actually does call and jump in specs through something called indirect branch tracking, but Microsoft doesn't use it because why would they? They already have infrastructure for Control Flow Guard and Extended Flow Guard. So they only use the backwards edge inspection part of CET, which is the shadow stack, which is that hardware protected stack. And the way this works is when a call instruction happens, what uh, we talked about earlier, return address is pushed onto the stack. Now we have an immutable copy of the stack known as the shadow stack, which is inaccessible from software. And that shadow stack contains all, only return addresses, no parameters. So now we push the return address onto both stacks. Well, what happens now when we overwrite the normal stack with 41s, for instance? The shadow stack is inaccessible from software, right? So we can't touch it. So when we overwrite the normal stack with 41s, the shadow stack does not get updated. And what the shadow stack does is it performs a check when a return happens. It says, hey, the stack on the stack that the users can access and the shadow stack, are they the same? If they're not, well, obviously the stack was overwritten and we crashed the process. So that means ROP is entirely mitigated at that point because what does ROP rely on? Flooding the stack with fake return addresses. Well, what does CET protect? Return addresses, and it's not software accessible. Well, technically it is software accessible for the like code that checks it, but user mode, for instance, um, can't access the kernel. That's where user mode CET checks are done. And then kernel mode CET is protected by something else, which we'll talk about later. So Windows CFI strategy, extended flow guard mitigates function pointer overwrites, CET protects return address overwrites. So that's the first staple of exploitation, right? We talked about hijacking control flow. That's the first thing exploits need to do. And these two strategies mitigate that. Um, but more time will need to pass for greater adoption of both of these mitigations. So CFI is great, but it's not resilient, right? So if, an, if we're able to somehow bypass these mitigations, what do we do? We just go back to the old way of exploitation, right? We use some kind of code reuse. There are other ones besides uh, return-oriented programming. And we just mark our shell code as executable and we're off to the races, right? Um, this is true with DEP and ASLR. We just get around uh, ASLR, go back to the old way, right? So our machines are only as safe as our CFI is good, right? Um, so we still need to address the other tenet of exploitation and that's preventing shell code execution. So, unsigned shellcode execution. This is achieved by violating memory permissions, as we talked about, right? The stack is executable, and what do we do? We use ROP to mark it as executable, um, just manually. So, DEP actually, as I mentioned, separates data and code boundaries. So, data, it's readable and writable because it stores data, obviously. Data doesn't need to be executed. Code should only be executed. We don't need to write to code. There's no reason. The code already exists when we compile the application. We don't need to write there. So violating DEP means we're either making code writable so we can place our shell code there, right? If we have an executable region of memory and it's not writable, we need to make it writable to place our shell code there. And additionally, data, it's writable so we can write our shell code there all day long, but it can never be executed because there's no execute permissions. We use ROP in that case to mark it as executable. So to combat this, um, Microsoft implement, implemented a mitigation called Arbitrary Code Guard, or ACG, which is definitely one of the most powerful mitigations, and it's not very uh, well known, I would say, outside of the exploitation scene. Um, and ACG is Microsoft's implementation of write, XOR, execute. And what that means is memory can either be writable or executable, but never both at the same time. Um, so let's take a look at how this works. So the stack, for instance, as I mentioned, what does it contain? Return addresses and parameters. We don't need to place code there. Code doesn't need to be executed off of the stack. 
So here's an example here. We see there's a return address for um, free heap internal. There's a few heap addresses and another memory address and all zeros, right? There's no code there. There's no no ops. There's no hardware breakpoints. There's no, nothing of that nature. Or software breakpoints, excuse me. So as I mentioned, data segments of memory never need to be executed. So uh, because of that, ACG enforces that DEP can never become code and code can never become writable. We know that DEP set those boundaries for us, but ACG enforces those. So here's an example here. On the right hand side, I'm calling virtual alloc, which will uh, create a page of memory essentially, allocate a page of memory. And if we look at the memory permissions, it's page read write. After I make page read write, so it's um, writable memory, I try to use virtual protect to mark it as execute. We see in the error here when I do this, Windows comes back and says the operation was blocked as the process prohibits dynamic code generation. That's arbitrary code guard kicking in. So as we know in our ROP chain, what did we do? We used virtual protect to, over, to um, excuse me, mark the stack as executable. When we do that here now, we get blocked. So how do we enable this? I thought I would throw this in here because, again, not a lot of people know about this. Um, the exploit protection settings in Defender, um, arbitrary code card is there, you can enable it. Or using the set process mitigation API, um, there's an enum value um, called um, process dynamic code policy, which goes together with a structure um, where you set um, prohibit dynamic code. Um, and that's the um, other way to say ACG. So prohibit dynamic code, ACG, they're synonymous. And the reason why we can enforce that data can never become code and code can never become writable is because the, the mitigation is implemented in the kernel. So it's a user mode only mitigation. So there's a user mode security boundary that Microsoft acknowledges. They don't acknowledge a lot of security boundaries, but this is one. User mode should not arbitrarily be able to access kernel mode. Um, so the, the integrity of this mitigation is protected by the kernel because all of the infrastructure is there. So an attacker, if you want to disable ACG, what do you need? Access to the kernel first. Well, if you're a user mode exploit and you've got access to the kernel, ACG is the least of your worries. You can do so much more than just disable ACG, right? And the way this works is there's a function called MI arbitrary code blocked. And what happens is, is we check if a process has arbitrary code guard enabled or if a special thread is allowed to opt out, which is there for legacy reasons. And if these things are true, which arbitrary code guard is enabled and we're dealing with a page permission change, um, instead of making the change happen, we just return a new error code to user mode called status dynamic code blocked. And so anytime you try to uh, make dynamically executable memory, you're gonna be returned with this. So attackers can no longer create a shell code, right? Um, but there are some interesting caveats here. And that's because arbitrary code guard was a mitigation made specifically for Microsoft Edge. Um, it was made with that in mind. Edge is now based on Chromium, but before Chromium, Edge was all Microsoft. And what I mean by that is they had their own JavaScript engine called Chakra, and they had all of this uh, in, uh, infrastructure for mitigations that they put a lot of time and effort in, and now they're in Chromium. Um, so I don't understand that, but I guess usability uh, for users, because this browser wasn't very good, but it's definitely like the most secure browser. And so Microsoft Edge um, is blessed with the most awesome gift we could have, and that's just like any other browser, and that's because it has a just-in-time engine. So the greatest gift with JIT is someone decided that taking the world's uh, most weakly typed language in JavaScript and directly compiling that down into assembly code for performance reasons. Um, so that's what most browsers do for performance benefits, right? So when you're making JITed code, you're constantly making dynamically, create, dynamically generated executable code, which just totally violates arbitrary code guard, right? And if you just made arbitrary code guard to just protect Microsoft Edge, you have an issue. So the answer to this was, it's a really cool um, engineering feat. Um, Edge uses an out-of-process JIT server. So what I mean by that is the Edge process, your browser you interface with, that's where you'll get hit by like a drive-by web attack um, where a binary exploit could happen, right? So that's protected by arbitrary code guard. The content process is what that's called, your tabs, et cetera. Now we have a JIT process, which is not protected by arbitrary code guard because it needs to constantly JIT and create assembly code and that gets injected into the content process. So that's kind of the engineering around how that works. And that leads to some awesome side effects. 
Uh, and the first one is, is because of this, the JIT process, which has no arbitrary code guard, is constantly injecting into the content process, which has arbitrary code guard. So Edge, uh, because of this issue, non-arbitrary, uh, non-protected processes by arbitrary code guard can always inject into processes protected by arbitrary code guard. I can't say that right anymore. I've been saying it so much um, because of this uh, design thing with Microsoft Edge, right? So that's the reason why uh, your malware, for instance, I talk to a lot of red teamers and we talk about arbitrary code guard and they say, why am I able to inject into processes protected by it? Well, your malware is probably not protected by arbitrary code guard. And so you're able to inject into processes protected by it. Even more interesting, a process that is protected by arbitrary code guard cannot inject into a process that is not protected by arbitrary code guard. Why is this? Well, if we compromise the content process in Edge, which has the mitigation enabled, why would we try to mess with arbitrary code guard there? I'm just going to try to migrate into the JIT process, which has what? Arbitrary code guard disabled. Well, Microsoft thought about this. So because of that, because of the two enablements, a protected process can't inject into a non-protected process, and that prevents that migration, which is a really interesting side effect. So ACG is a really awesome mitigation for what it sets out to do. And that's to prevent an exploited process with ACG enabled from creating dynamically executable code or from migrating into a process that is not protected by it. Um, so it covers both of those. So we've talked about arbitrary code guard as a user mode mitigation, but what about kernel exploits? What about kernel mode arbitrary code guard? So we talked about CFG has support in both user mode and kernel mode. What about arbitrary code guard? Here's the issue. What is arbitrary code guard protected by? The user mode, kernel mode, security boundary. Well, if the kernel is the highest security boundary on the OS, and we try to implement the mitigation of kernel mode ACG in the kernel, that's basically assuming an attacker already has access to the kernel and using a mitigation that tries to prevent an attacker that's in the kernel. So the kernel's trying to defend against itself, right? If I'm an attacker and I know arbitrary code guards in the kernel and it's implemented there, why would I try to do anything? I'm just gonna disable the mitigation first because I already have kernel mode access and then I'll be on my merry way. Um, so that would render it useless. So we need some way to address this issue. Microsoft actually made a really awesome and quite novel way to address this. And that's we use a higher security boundary than the kernel and that's the hypervisor. Um, if you've ever heard of Credential Guard, for instance, if you run an enterprise, this is a feature that falls under the suite of security features called virtualization-based security. And basically, it's provided by Hyper-V, the Microsoft hypervisor. So we have a higher security boundary than the kernel now. So Windows is now broken up into two virtual trust levels. And VTLs are basically VMs. VMs, for all intents and purposes, are an isolated piece of memory. That's what a VTL is. But a VTL doesn't have a virtual hard disk, networking, any of those things. It's just an isolated region of memory. And we have two of those now. Uh, we have Secure World, which is VTL1, and we have Normal World, which is VTL0. And as I mentioned, VTLs are just isolated regions of memory. And this uh, mitigation, VBS, it abuses the technologies that are used to isolate normal VMs, and that's something called second layer address translation, or some call it second level address translation, or SLAT. That's a CPU feature. And Intel's implementation of that is known as extended page tables. So if you've ever looked on the Windows internals book, uh, in the seventh edition part one, this is a diagram taken from there. And this is how the OS looks now with VBS enabled. So we have VTL0, which is our traditional user and kernel mode, right? That's where when you boot your machine and you have VBS enabled, that's what you're going to be dropped into. It won't be transparent to you, but that's where you're operating in. And we have VTL1, which is secure world. And that is allowed to securely configure VTL0, which is what normal, op or normal operators are in. So we assume that's untrusted. And it's able to store some secrets that are inaccessible from um, VTL0. That's actually how Credential Guard works. Um, those secrets that are normally dumped with Mimikatz, et cetera, they're stored in VTL1 and it's inaccessible from VTL0. VTLs can't access each other. They're isolated, just like VMs are. So how does this look? We'll look at a concrete example uh, in a few more slides. But what happens is um, attackers, 
um, when they have access to the kernel, they'll locate something called the page table entries. And the PTEs are the kernel or the operating system's view of memory. And what I mean by that is PTEs describe memory. So if I have a piece of shell code, there's a corresponding page table entry that says, hey, that shell code, it's readable, writable, valid, it's a user mode page or a kernel mode page, that sort of thing. And so that contains all the metadata, right? Well, if I'm an attacker, I try to locate the PTE that corresponds to memory I can control. And what I do is I corrupt that metadata to trick the operating system into thinking, hey, this, is, this PTE describes this page as readable, writable, executable, which should never be the case because of DEP. Um, so we can basically do the same thing as ROP, um, but using just corrupting page table entries. We can manually mark our controlled memory as executable. Well, VTL1 can actually combat this. And the way it works is it configures memory permissions to its own liking. Um, and all of those permissions are now stored in the extended page tables, which is the hypervisor's view of memory. And so the extended page tables protect that metadata. And this is because the hypervisor is a higher security boundary. The kernel can't directly access the hypervisor and the page tables. It's completely uh, isolated. The, the operating system won't know about it. We'll see an example of this in the next slide. And the way this works is this is how the arbitrary code guard in the kernel works. VTL1, which is um, configuring the extended page tables, again, protected by the hypervisor, it configures memory just like arbitrary code guard. Everything is write, XOR, execute. Nothing can be writable and executable at the same time. And that policy is known as hypervisor protected code integrity or HVCI. And that's what we call the arbitrary code guard of kernel mode. And let's look at an example of why this is useful. So as I mentioned, we have some shell code that's located in the kernel. We have a page table entry that corresponds to that shell code that's stored in the kernel. Now we also have an extended page table entry that's managed by the hypervisor. Um, so what happens is an attacker tries to locate the PTE corresponding to their shell code. Right now it says this page is R for readable, W for writable. We use a vulnerability to corrupt this. So now we can see memory is executable according to the page table entry. But the hypervisor says, no, this page is still readable and writable because that extended page table entry is not accessible from the kernel. It's protected by the hypervisor. And so what happens is the kernel will think, oh, executable page, let me go execute that. And when you go to execute it, you actually get an access violation because that memory access is gated by the hypervisor. And we can check, hey, we see we're going to access some executable memory. Let me check what the hypervisor says about this. Oh, hypervisor said this is only readable and writable. Sorry, we're not going to execute this. So kernel mode vulnerabilities all day long. You can have full kernel mode access and you can corrupt the page table entries all you want. It's not going to work. Um, so as I mentioned, HVCI, we can't create dynamically executable code in the kernel anymore. That's because the true permissions, which don't have any writable and, read writable and executable code, it's managed by the hypervisor and the kernel can't tamper with that. And that's why it's called ACG of the kernel. So we've talked about now uh, addressing the root cause of exploitation. So let's kind of look at this new era of exploitation. So ASLR uh, and DEP made exploitation more tedious, but it didn't really change how we did things, right? Once we're around ASLR using either a non-compiled DLL or non-ASLR DLL or a um, um, vulnerability to leak memory, we can just use a ROP chain to disable DEP essentially for that page. Um, so with the advent of control flow integrity and write to XOR execute, we really have to adapt our exploitation. So the first way we can go about this is just by playing by the rules of the mitigation, right? What does arbitrary code guard say? It says we can't create uh, any memory that's dynamically executable. So what if we just use a code reuse like ROP for instance, instead of using that to violate DEP to mark memories executable, we can build our entire payload in ROP. So like a shell code blob from a C2 framework or something, all it's doing is calling into Windows APIs, opening up network connections, doing those sort of things, right? We can just do that in pure ROP. It's, it's extremely tedious, but we can build the whole payload in ROP. Additionally, uh, more um, well-known are data-only attacks. So we know we can't do what? We can't hijack control flow, and we can't mark memory as writable and executable at the same time. Um, but what's stopping us from targeting data structures that are crucial, right? Um, it is worthwhile to know that we're starting to see a few more mitigations that target data-only attacks, one of them being kernel data protection. 
And the way this works is it uses the same infrastructure as HVCI. And what I mean by that is we can protect static and dynamic memory with a few caveats uh, through the extended page tables. Um, so an example of this is GCI options. Um, so if you're a red teamer, you, there's some, a few blogs on this. Um, and there's some bring your own vulnerable driver attacks. Um, and what they try to do is um, they have kernel mode access, for instance, and they try to disable um, driver signing requirements. That's managed by this static global variable, which is a bit mask that says, hey, driver signing is required. Well, if you can read and write into the kernel, you could disable that, right? You could just clear that bit mask and now you can load your own drivers. Well, that's not good. So kernel data protection can protect static data like this. Uh, there's a new function called MM protect driver section. And here's an image from Ida from ci.dll, which is codeintegrity.dll. And we can protect this global variable to make it read only. And that's done at the hypervisor level. So again, just like HVCI, even when we try to corrupt the page table entries, we can't do it because it's managed by the hypervisor. Same thing here, we can't corrupt it. So it comes in static and dynamic format, but I have an asterisk there because there's a caveat to this. Um, GIC options is a global static variable, so that's protected by static KDP. Um, however, only memory allocated in place into what a new feature called the secure pool, which there's a blog written by one of my old coworkers, um, Jordan Shafir. Um, so it's on the Windows internals blog. It kind of goes over a secure pool and dynamic KDP. I would highly recommend you check that out. Um, so only memory placed in there is protected by dynamic KDP. So what if we targeted other dynamic data like a process object, which is not allocated or placed into that secure pool, at least at the moment. So let's look at an example of corrupting an e-process object. What do most kernel exploits want to do? They want to achieve system privileges, right? At least when we're trying to prove them, right? Like nation states, they may want to load a rootkit or do something else, but that's what most exploits seem to do. Well, normally what we would do is in shell code, we would um, have some shell code that elevates us to system, but we can't generate any shell code anymore because of HVCI. So what if we do a data-only attack to mimic the same thing, right? Well, the system process on Windows, that's responsible for housing the majority of kernel mode threads. And the system process runs with system privileges, obviously, right? And each process is represented in the executive of the kernel, which is like the object manager, all of those things, as an e-process object. Each e-process object has a token member. And we're all in security or know about security, so token enforces the permissions of that object, essentially, right? So what if we could use a data-only attack to locate the e-process object corresponding to the system process, locate our own exploits uh, e-process token, and then copy the privileged system token over our token. Well, here's what this looks like in the debugger. Um, so in the top left, we can see eProcess. We're verifying, yes, it does have a token member, which is of type um, executive fast reference union, um, which is just the way it's denoted, essentially. And what we can do is we can locate all the processes and filter out the one named system. And we can leak, or, or not leak, we're in the debugger. We can locate the token. We can do the same thing for our cmd.exe process. Once we locate those, we just copy the system one over ours, and we can see what happens to our command prompt. We're elevated to system privileges. I just use an example in the debugger because it's a lot easier to visualize. But if you're in the kernel and you know the layout of memory, you can locate the eProcess object of those two things, and you can do the copy. So conclusion. Exploitation, it's less widespread. That was the question we kind of asked ourselves. Why in the red team sphere are we seeing shifts in other research and not binary exploitation? Well, these mitigations, I mean, I did some research on HVCI. That was like five months of uh, my life pretty much, right? Like if you're burning and churning engagements, um, that's a lot of research to go into. Um, exploitation has evolved and it's actually harder to detect that. It's a side effect, sorry, stumbled. Um, so. If we have shell code, right, that's probably in a heap address or on the stack, um, or let's just say it's a heap address for this example, and it's readable, writable, and executable. Well, that's a heap address that's not backed by disk, and it's readable, writable, executable. Well, most EDRs are going to pick that up because that's really sketchy to have heap memory that's used to store data, which is executable, and it's not part of a DLL. Um, so that was how we did old exploitation. That's much easier to detect. Well. It's much harder to detect a, just a simple corruption of one field in a data structure. That's much harder to detect. Um, so as a side effect, it's a little bit harder to detect.
Um, and research, as I mentioned, shifted into other things, right? Like C2 frameworks. Uh, good thing there was no drama with that this year. Um, social engineering, et cetera, all of those things. Um, so that's where the research has really shifted. And lastly, all of those mitigations, that's not a product, right? That's just Microsoft for free. Now you have to have uh, supported hardware granted, but those are free mitigations that you can enable by default um, that are extremely powerful. And so with that, that's the end of my talk and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. So is it possible to convince the hypervisor to uh, dark and extended page table yeah, so the question was, um, we know with the page table entries, we can't mark something as executable in the page table entries, but can we coerce the hypervisor to update their extended page table? Um, no, we can't really, but there is a legitimate interface to do that. It's something called the hypercall. So if you're familiar with system call, um, that's what the hypervisor uses. And obviously, page permission changes have to happen. We're addressing the malicious ones, but legitimately, sometimes page permissions have to get updated. And the hypercall is like a secure channel, basically, that um, you can uh, request that your extended page table entry be updated in the extended page table entries. So it is possible, but I haven't looked into like maliciously abusing that. Yeah. A little louder, please. Why is not why is ACG not enabled by default? The jitting problem. Um, so we have a lot of things like .NET, for instance. That's an interpreted language, and the uh, common language runtime library and the JIT get loaded in, creating dynamically executable code all the time. And to be honest, a lot of software is um, poorly written. And um, like one of the requirements, for instance, Microsoft on their website for HVCI, which is arbitrary code guard in the kernel, your driver cannot create any readable, writable, executable memory. Well, some drivers and applications, even if they're not malicious, do that. And it's a performance thing, unfortunately. Any others? Are there any questions on Discord, maybe? No? Yes? Bueller? No? Guess not. Okay, anyways, thanks. <laughs>